actually, I think um, we can start. So uh, welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Matthew Walter, who is an assistant professor at the Toyota, Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago. Uh, something about Matthew. So he obtained his PhD from MIT uh, and the Hood's uh, whole oceanographic institution, where his thesis focused on improving the efficiency of inference for simulation, simultaneous localization and mapping. So his research in general revolves around the uh, intelligent, perceptually aware robots uh, that are able to act robustly and effectively in unstructured environments, uh, in particular with people. Uh, and he has investigated various, various areas or, of robotics uh, with various robotic platforms, as you can see in the bio. And these include uh, underwater vehicles, self-driving vehicles, uh, autonomous wheelchairs, mobile manipulators, and most importantly, as we know, uh, autonomous cars for ducks. So he's uh, heavily involved uh, in the in Ducky Town from the early days. Today's talk is gonna focus about uh, ways to measure and move and joint optimization of design of, of a physical agent plus the computational reasoning. And this, this is very interesting to us. So we are all very happy to, to listen to the talk and I give the stage to you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, great. Thank you for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. You know, I'll be at virtually. Um, hopefully soon I'll make it back out to, to Zurich. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about some of the recent work that a few people in my group have done on, as the title shows, looking at co-optimization problems. So it's part of a, you know, a general thread that we've been looking at where you have some physical system <clears throat> couple that perform that performs some computational reasoning, and you want to jointly optimize that physical system and that computational reasoning piece. Um, and that may take various forms. And we'll talk about a few of those today. I should say, if you have any questions, please, please feel free just to jump in um, and ask them during the talk. Uh, I don't see where the chat is, so just feel free just to ask. Um, before I begin, typically what I'd like to do is give people an intro to TTI Chicago, because it's most, many people have not heard of TTI. We're very new. Um, so by pretty much any standard, university standard, we're brand new. So we were founded in 2003 with an endowment from TTI Nagoya, Japan. So Toyota gave us this 255 million, roughly, it might be, I think it might be higher now, endowment. And that's a big part of the reason why we have Toyota in our name. We're not affiliated with Toyota. Um, we don't, you know, we're not a research arm of Toyota. We're distinct from TRI, Toyota Research Institute. But we do, we are, uh, we do have a close relationship with TTI in Nagoya, Jap uh, Japan. And so TTIC is very unique. Uh, so we are a graduate only, primarily PhD uh, CS Institute. So we're like a computer science department university in one. We have 11 tenure track faculty and 10 research assistant professors. This is not a soft money, this is a hard money position. So you get, it's a three year endowed position. So you get a competitive salary um, just to do research. There's no teaching obligation whatsoever. You can if you want, but you don't have to teach. Um, you get a research budget. It's a great opportunity. So please, you know, I encourage you. We're still, you know, we're in the hiring season, um, a little at the end of it. But, you know, if, you know, if you're looking and in going into going into academia or maybe have not yet made up your mind, please consider applying. Um, TTIC itself is very focused. So we're computer science, but even within computer science, we focus on computer science theory, machine learning theory, and what we call machine learning applications. So that's computer vision robotics, speech, NLP, computational biology. Um, so this is a view of our, we're actually, if you look at this image here, we're just south of this look. Can you see my mouse actually? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, so we're just yes. south of here. So this is U Chicago's campus. And we're closely affiliated with the University of Chicago and we're just south of here. Uh, we're the TTI and Kitty. Um, anyway, so it's just my somewhat shameless plug and really just advertising TTIC. So again, I, can, I encourage you to apply both for the PhD program for any undergrads, as well as for the, the faculty tenure track or research track. Okay, so with that, just a brief introduction to some of the folks in my lab. So we, our lab is called Robotic Intelligence or Robot Intelligence Through Perception Lab using perception broadly. Um, so we do a fair bit of work on language as a sensing modality. Uh, we do some work on design and control. This is CHIP, and that's largely the work that I'll talk about. Some work on transfer learning. Some of my students work on RL theory uh, and, and, and 3D vision. Um, 
Okay, so again, motivating this idea of coupled design and computational reasoning. So say you were designing a camera and with the, uh, with the goal of doing semantic segmentation. So you have a, you know, a, a, a video feed like this and you want to segment out objects of interest. Again, this is in the, in the context of self-driving, so pedestrian, trees, cars, road, curbs, et cetera. And what if you had the luxury of designing the camera itself? So designing the sensor. So that's the physical design. You have the luxury of choosing where the, uh, um, the, the designing the sensor array as well as the computational reasoning. And so again, today that's gonna to look like a neural network. Something that's gonna take the output of this sensor and, or sorry, take this, the, sorry, take this sensor as input and regress to or output this semantic segmentation. Okay, so you have this system where you have on the left, we have light coming in from the environment and we have this parameterized design space, parameterized by some, uh, by theta. Um, and then that gives us some image. And what we want to do with that image is we want to feed that to some computational reason, some inference architecture, which again, as I mentioned, would be largely, you know, today, a neural network to regress to, let's say again, the label for each, or not regress, but label each pixel. So again, that's the design and the computational reasoning. And so what we want to be able to do is we want to couple those, or we, those are coupled rather, we want to be able to optimize those jointly. Another version of this might be um, computational reasoning is that is in the beginning. So we have an image that um, comes in and or whatever our input modality is that gives control signals to a robot manipulator. So an end effector. And we want to perform some manipulation tasks. So in this cartoon example, we're moving one object, an object from one location to another. Um, you can imagine that how these two problems might be coupled. Some particular designs might make the control or the computational reasoning piece easier than others. Um, some allocation of fingers might make manipulation of certain objects easier than others. So can we again consider optimizing both the physical design of the robot, choosing maybe how many fingers to have, how many digits within each finger, what the dimensions of those digits are, where to place motors, what the, how strong those motors should be, et cetera. That's the design space. And then this computational reasoning piece that takes images in and figures out what the appropriate grasp is for these objects. Okay, so let's go back to an example. It's a little bit different, but an imaging example. <coughs> so we have as input some representation of the scene. And what we want to do is we want to then reconstruct the image. So what we're going to do is we're going to have this multiplexing pattern. You may be familiar with a debayer multiplexing. And then what we want to do is we want to take this pattern and we want to demosaic it. We want to reconstruct the RGB image. So let's look at what this, again, these designs might look like. So what's, what we're visualizing here is these designs over time. So again, in, in this, if you're not familiar with the, with the Bayer pattern, so each receptor in this array ha has a filter in front of it. And so it's excited by that filter allows red, green, or blue light through. So that the, the sensor is measuring the amount of incident light uh, um, with frequency that matches, you know, whatever the, the green filter or the red filter, or the blue filter. And so our design, our design decision now is whether or not at each location in this grid to place a filter. And if we do place a filter there, which channel, which color it's, it's passing through. And we want to decide this with the objective of having the output together with our, with our demosaicing, this is our computational reasoning, allow us to reconstruct the original image. And so what we're showing here on the, on the bottom was this evolution of this pattern throughout training. And so again, if we're doing this as a neural network, we'll see in a bit how we can structure this in such a way that we can optimize both jointly using standard uh, stochastic gradient descent. So standard methods for optimizing neural networks. Okay. So let's look at what the output might be. And it's a little bit, you know, it might be a little bit tough to tell depending on the resolution over Zoom. But on the bottom here, what I'm showing on the left is a traditional Bayer pattern. So most cameras that we use today have this Bayer pattern. And there's a demosaicing process that converts the signal from this array to an image. And so you can see here on the left, now I lost my mouse, but on the left, you can see a reconstruction of this of the scene that you get with the debayer, uh, with debayering. So again, demosaicing this Bayer-based result. Whereas on the right, we're showing an image that gets demosaic 
using this learned uh, allocation of filters together with that together with the learned computational reasoning piece, the D mosaic piece. And again, it might be difficult to tell over Zoom, but the one on the right is noticeably, again, to my eye here, crisper. So there's there's le high, higher detail on the right than there is on the left because we have the luxury of choosing the uh, the the design of the sensor jointly. Okay, so that's motivation, and we'll look at it. You know what might seem to be a very different application or very different problem, but one that's actually very similar, which is sensor design and inference. So say we have some array of sensors that we want to distribute in the environment to infer some spatial phenomena. We might want to measure temperature distribution. We might in the left want to localize a target, and that's really what we're going to be focusing on. So on the left, what we're showing is these acoustic transponders that are used underwater. So GPS does not work underwater. So what we typically will do is we'll de deploy these beacons, these transponders, we'll estimate their location, and then these transponders will ping the vehicle or vice versa. And using time of flight, we can measure, we can triangulate the position of the vehicle. So the AUV in this example. Another application that you might be familiar with is Wi-Fi based localization. So a number of airports, at least in the US have this, where they basically exploit the Wi-Fi access points through the building to as, as a form, as a way of doing localization. So you can take out your cell phone, you can open up an app, and based upon the signal strength to the particular access points that you see, you can get an estimate of where you are, you know, at, at pretty high accuracy. Um, I was just speaking with someone the other day where they do a, use a system like this for people who are visually impaired in their home, for example. They, may, they, they place beacons around in the environment and they use those beacons to localize an agent. Uh, again, this is a problem that's been addressed for, for decades, you know, more generally in this idea of designing, uh, identifying uh, locations for sensors and then the corresponding inference strategy. And so that's really what we're, we're looking at is in the context of localization, we have three things that we have to consider. So one is, where do I place beacons? Where do I place sensors in the environment? Uh, in our case, we're looking at sensors that may broadcast on different channels. So now we, we have to choose where do I place sensors, but also for each sensor on which of, let's say, 16 different channels does it broadcast. And then as an agent moves through this environment, or as we're trying to estimate some, uh, some more general spatial phenomena, like a temperature distribution, how do we take the readings from these sensors that are going to be noisy and regress to whatever our target is? The location of the user, say, for example. And in large part, existing work almost exclusively looks at these two problems as being independent. And there are well, you know, well established methods for designing placement of beacons. There's a classic art gallery problem. If you're not familiar with that, the motivation is, say, on the left, you have an art gallery with art, you know, with artwork, and you have end security guards, and you want to choose where to place them in the environment such that every piece of art is visible from at least one security guard. Um, so that's a very standard approach for deciding placement. Again, it's doing this in a way that's independent of inference, independent of computational reasoning, but it's a heuristic that's still widely used. So again, and, and, and many other work in, in this area and related areas, um, again, choosing uh, sensor locations for Wi-Fi based localization, or again, more generally estimating different phenomena. Um, I'll just, for the sake of time, I'll go, uh, well, I'll just mention this. There's been some recent work that looks at this in a different domain that we'll actually touch on later on in the talk, but is choosing, say, for example, you have a robot gripper and, you're, and you want to, and maybe it's a soft robot gripper and you, you want to place strain gauges on this gripper. And you want to choose, where do I place strain gauges? I, maybe I have a fixed budget or at least a cost associated with each strain gauge. So I want to choose where to place them on this end effector. And that's what's on the right here. These blue dots are different locations for the strain gauge with the objective of either A, inferring uh, or classifying the object that's being manipulated. So that's the inference task or estimating stiffness, estimating pose of the manipulator. Uh, so this is recent work that tries to do this. And so this is what we're, what we're focused on, is this idea of doing this data-driven joint optimization of physical design of a system. Uh, you know, it's a soft robot, it's a hard, rigid robot, it's where to place sensors, and then the corresponding computational reasoning piece. And so what we assume in this, in this first part of the work is 
we have some representation of the environment. We'll see that's in a bit that that's a floor plan. We have a differential model of how signals propagate. So the signals that are received by or transmitted, received by the either the, the user walking through this environment or the sensors located in the environment. A candidate set of places where we can put sensors and a set of different transmission channels. And what we want our algorithm to output is an optimal placement of sensors, channel allocation, as well as the corresponding spatial inference function. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to jump in. Okay, so let's look at a cartoon example of what this might be. So what I'm showing here with these, with these circles are different uh, sensor locations. Color indicates which channel they're broadcasting over. So one is red is channel one, blue is, is, is channel two. This open circle, these open circles on the right are indicating that can, indicating candidate locations where we've chosen not to place sensors. And these sensors in this case are transmitting, not receiving. So they're transmitting signals to this receiver shown by this little cartoon satellite. So I've already mentioned this. Yep, those are the different channels. And what we might want to do is we might want to indicate for each one of these, again, what channel they're broadcasting over. So we have, again, we have a candidate set of locations. I'm showing four here, but you know, in practice, it's, it's much higher. And for each location, we have an indicator function. And this indicator function is, is if it's X, what's shown in the X here is indicating that, there's, that there is no beacon there. There is no sensor there. Otherwise, it's indicating which channel it's broadcast on. So it's this, it's this one hot vector of dimension C plus one, where C is the number of channels. Again, that plus one is the indicator for no beacon being placed there. Okay, so that's, we assume that we, again, that's our design space. So these locate the fixed set of locations, each location, this C plus one dimensional one hot vector. And then at, at, a, at a candidate receiver location, again, showed by this little cartoon satellite dish, we're able to receive signals, for, no, noise corrupted signals from each one of these beacons, each one of these transmitters. Let's see if I can find, how we can get a, um, a cursor. Anyway, um, so, okay, so that's the measured signal strength. So that's this function psi here, or sigma, like epsilon there, but psi is giving a candidate beacon location and a, 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 a beacon location and channel allocation, as well as the receiver's location in the environment and is giving us the signal that will be received. And again, this is a model that includes noise, uh, effects of obstruction. So you can imagine again, if they're transmitting RF signals, they're, they'll be affected by walls, et cetera. Um, and then the receiver takes this signal S and that gets fed to some inference function. Again, we'll see in practice, we'll see that that's gonna be a neural network that takes that signal and then regresses to the location, the, the user's location. So again, the, the location of that, the, the satellite dish in the environment, tries to estimate the satellite location. And so what we want to do is we want to jointly optimize both the beacon placement and their channel. So that's I sub L and this inference function F of the parameters of that function more specifically, such that we get the best estimate of the target's location fairly straightforward. And so this is just a block diagram visualization of what, what we have. So again, coming in on the left, we have, when we, what we're doing again is a data-driven fashion. So we have a, a target at a known location in the environment. We have a particular, let's say, beacon allocation. So channels and whether or not to place a beacon at a particular location. That gets fed through this signal propagation function that's telling me that for this candidate location V of the user in, the, in this environment, when they're in their office, let's say, for example, and this allocation of beacons, what signal do they see? That gets fed to this inference function F that tries to estimate the, estimate their location, V hat. And we use that to compute a loss. You can imagine L2 loss, say, for example. And what we would like to be able to do is we would like to use that loss, take gradients of that loss, and pass that back through to the beacon location. So as we pass it through the inference function, we're using that to update, update the parameters of the inference network. And as we pass back to the beacon location, we're using that to update their, the allocation of beacons, both the placement and their channel allocation. And what we're going to assume now is that F and Psi are differentiable, so we can back propagate. Um, but of course, the I's, for I, we have this one hot vector. 
right? So it's indicating whether or not there's a beacon there, and if there is, which of the C, capital C, different channels it's broadcasting on. So that's not differentiable. We use a, a standard trick where we use a soft max to get, you know, so we can basically get the soft weight. And then we that allows us then to get a differentiable function that we can now back, right? So that's what this I tilde is this approximate one, you know, this, this soft max. So now we can solve for the weights and then we can threshold that to estimate the whether or not, again, there's a beacon there as assign a beacon as well as this channel. Um, and if we train this, we have this temperature parameter over this distribution such that it's more uh, it's spread out initially, but we increase the temperature during training to make it more peaked. Uh, okay, so our goal now is to minimize this fairly simple loss, right? So on the right-hand side, again, we have a set of candidate locations in the environment. We'll say, okay, what if I was in my office? What signal strength would I see based upon this current allocation of sensors? Again, the softmax, the I tilde or allocation of beacons. Um, and where would I predict myself to be, right? So that gives us this L2 loss. And again, we're going to average this over a bunch of different locations in the environment. And then we have this regularization term that you can imagine is penalizing us. Yeah, you can imagine it, think of it as a cost for allocating beacons. You know, beacons aren't free, so we might want to penalize uh, uh, the addition of new beacons. And I should say, uh, the code for this project is all, is all publicly available on uh, Chip's website or his GitHub page. Okay, so I've already, I've already mentioned this. Um, so F and Psi are differentiable. So the great thing about this is really what it amounts to is, so the, I've, I've argued that we, we formulate the inference piece as a neural network. And the way that we're representing the beacon placement, you can imagine it almost like it, our environment is that if you look at it from above, it's a, it's a floor plan. We can discretize this floor plan into a bunch of grids. Each grid is a candidate location for a beacon. And for that location, there, there you could think of it as a pixel and that pixel can take on one of C plus one values. You know, again, C, for the number of channels or that additional plus one if there's no beacon there. So we can treat the, the design space, we can think about it much like an image. And that really we can formulate this as a layer in our neural network. So this initial layer that's just capturing the sensor design. And now we can back propagate using standard stochastic gradient descent to back propagate through our network, through the, the, this design layer to jointly optimize both inference and uh, beacon allocation. So just be a standard stochastic gradient descent. So look at some examples. So we're seeing here are some floor plans. So uh, number one here is actually the, before we did our renovations here, the floor plan, one of the floors at, at TTIC. And we have other office-like environments that we've, that we've generated. Um, and so what we want to be able to do to train this model is we want to have our agent here, this little robot with candidate beacon locations. And we want to see for these locations, what, what signal would the user get? And so that's this function psi, right? So the psi takes the, the user's or the agent's location V, this particular beacon allocation, whether or not there's a beacon there and what channels it's broadcasting on, and gives us the signal that would be received across all C channels. And so we have our model that does this and it takes into effect uh, obstructions due to walls, noise, interference more generally, uh, or I should say interference between signals. So it's a reasonably, accurate signal propagation model. And we collect a data set given this floor plan, given this floor plan, we move the agent around in the environment and we generate what signals we would see at each one of those locations. And that's how we collect this data set. And then what we do is we pass these signals, we, again, we have a neural network whose responsibility is to output the, or estimate the, the agent's location. And it's, again, it's a fairly shallow neural network feed forward neural network architecture that takes these signals and regresses to location. Again, as I mentioned before, we have a regularization term that's trying to uh, penalize adding more beacons. Okay, so let's look at what this might look like here. So what I'm visualizing, again, this is the TTIC map. And what I'm, again, the scale is, is normalized. Um, so what we're looking at is localization error. So that's what this heat map is generating. So this is estimate localization error at at various locations in the environment for this, for this particular beacon allocation. So again, the colors here denote where there's a dot, there is a, there is a beacon, and then its color indicates the channel. Uh, and so we could see in this case that it's learning a pretty sparse allocation of beacons 
that results in fairly low uh, localization error. There are some areas where it's higher than others. You can actually see these traces emanating from doorways where there's more uh, interference uh, between, between signals. Um, and we look at various different things. So what's the worst case error? What's different failure rates? And again, I'll go through this pretty, you know, relatively quickly because it may not be terribly, you know, heavy going into in detail later on. But basically, you know, we, we might say how many locations is, for how many locations in the environment is the estimate more than, you know, again, this is normalized, more than 0.1 off, let's say. So that's this, the failure rate. And we do have various different thresholds. Um, okay, so we look at this for a different, a, a, a different, amount, different methods, I should say. And one thing we wanted to figure out first is, is a neural network a reasonable strategy to be doing this, right? So our assumption now is that our inference network is a neural network that we can back propagate through, but maybe that's not the best. So, you know, previously a, a standard really state-of-the-art approach to doing localization based upon signal strength was using K nearest neighbors. So you can imagine what you might do, and this is in fact when a long time ago when I was at MIT, the, my group, or the group that I was in was working on this for localizing a wheelchair moving through a long-term care facility. And you go through, you can imagine going through this environment with your, let's say your phone, say with some Wi-Fi device, and at each location recording the, the, the signal strength from each of the, the access points that are nearby. And it acts much like a fingerprint for that location. You move to a different location, record the fingerprint, and you continue in this fashion. So now at test time, what you can do is you have an agent in this environment, you see which access points it's, it's able to see, and the signal strength from each one of these access points. And you compare that to this, uh, with this map, essentially, that you've built, and you use K nearest neighbors to figure out where the agent is. And again, that's a fairly standard approach to doing localization. So first thing we wanted to make sure is, well, one, does use of a you know, neural network at least perform as well as K nearest neighbors, which was again, largely the state of the art. And we found that it, and it does. And there are other people now that are and, and really before this, we are not the first to propose using neural networks for this task, but other people were doing this as, uh, were doing this as well. And it yields better performance. That's just a sanity check that we wanted to do. Okay, so what we wanted to do now, now that we've known, now that we know that, you know, a neural network is a reasonable strategy for doing inference, how much better can we do with our learned beacon allocation compared to an expert designed allocation of beacons. And so that's what we're showing here. Again, it's the tables may be a little bit ugly, but the last three rows in this table are co-optimized beacon allocation. So both channel and location and inference architecture for different regularization penalties. So when we have a low penalty or really it doesn't, we can easily add more and more beacons. Um, that's, that's the top of those three rows. And then what we look at is a high regularizer and then a, a regularizer that we anneal during training. We actually, in fact, we found that that yields the best results, uh, but even a high fixed regularizer yields low RMSE. So, you know, but, uh, um, and, and worst case, average and worst case and low failure rates uh, uh, compared to the, compared to the uh, handcrafted baselines. But annealing this regularizer sort of helps with this optimization landscape the best and has a nice trade-off between the number of beacons, you know, 25 as opposed to 12, but significantly lower RMSE and lower failure rates. Again, these numbers in parentheses are the, you know, what percentage of locations, uh, for, for what percentage of locations is the estimate more than 0.1 off or more than 0.2 off or more than 0.5 off? And that's what we're visualizing on the bottom here, these different uh, results, fixed, low fixed regularizer, high fixed regularizer in the middle, and then this annealed regularizer. We tried this for a bunch of different locations. So there's just a video showing the evolution of this sensor design, the beacon allocation during training for one of these maps. So initially it adds a, a lot of beacons, but then quickly it learns again, I don't remember which one of this is, this might be the annealed regularizer. It learns to sparsify pretty quickly that it's not worth adding more beacons because of the cost. And it can still, without those beacons, it can achieve low error. Okay. And we looked at other things like how, how sensitive is this method to, um, to different levels of, of, of noise, different degrees of attenuation. Uh, how well does it perform when there are fewer channels to, to pick from, more channels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so that's one example of this idea of co-optimization of, 
physical design of a system, in this case, where to place sensors, and the computational reasoning piece, in this case, inference. And so what I'll go on to, oh, the sound is not really necessary here. Okay, so awesome. Well, at least interesting. So we're going to look at this in a very different domain, which is legged locomotion. And again, I'm not a legged locomotion person by any means, um, but you know, it's an area that is, is very interesting from the perspective, I would argue, of co-optimization. So what we're showing in the upper left is a pretty classic, the classic work of Tad McGear. Um, from the early 90s on exploiting knowledge of the dynamics of this passive walker. So again, it's this, what they call a ballistic walker. So using gravity to walk down a slope, um, no act, internal actuation, but exploiting knowledge of the dynamics to achieve a gait that results in a limit cycle. So that's what's shown in the, in the, upper, in the uh, upper left there. So this phase plot there. Um, for this walker. Uh, Andy Arena at, at Cornell has done you know, a, a lot of great work in this area. This is showing one of his walkers. Again, it's a ballistic walker, again, walking downhill. Um, again, exploiting knowledge of the dynamics. Um, and then you know, Spring Flamingo from Leg Lab or when, when Robert was at MIT. And uh, at the bottom, I'm sure you've all seen videos of Honda's, uh, sorry, Honda's, uh, Boston Dynamics Atlas. It's you know, pretty amazing what they do. Uh, by exploiting the dynamics of, 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 their, uh, of the robot. Um, and again, it's not clear, but I think people have some understanding of what they're doing, but again, it's, they're not, it's some you know, secret sauce, if you will. Um, and then Honda Asimo, which is really exploiting a very uh, conservative strategy for both the design, the, the larger feet, and then, and then the particular gate as well. And so what we're looking at doing in this domain is thinking about this as a coupled design and control problem. So you can imagine now that what if you have the luxury, and that's what's happening in, with McGear's Walker and Andrew and, and many, many of these robots really, is that you have experts who are designing this robot to exhibit some desired properties. So exhibit dynamics that allow for this you know, limit cycle associated with ballistic walking or the size of the feet that make it possible for Honda Asimo to have this conservative, but generally stable, though not terribly robust, gait, uh, or the spring flamingo on the right. Um, so there's, there's this physical design of the robot, but also the control policy or the, the, the motion that it follows when locomoting. Okay. And so most people have largely decoupled this, these problems. Again, that's not it, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Certainly, I think some of the videos we we're looking at before were examples where people are designing them with particular dynamics in mind because they understand that it's going to make the control problem easy or going to allow for ballistic locomotion. Um, that, that's one. And then there's been a more recently the, this trend to formulate both of these in the context of trajectory optimization. So where, again, you might typically use trajectory optimization given the design to design the gate or design the trajectory of, of the robot. There has been some work out of you know, Russ Tedrick's group, uh, Daniela Roos and others, where you formulate the design as additional parameters to optimize via trajectory optimization. And these methods have, you know, have proven pretty effective, you know, at least in, in simulation, but they have some limitations. So one, they assume full knowledge of the robot's dynamics, including collision dynamics. They require an expert or someone to provide an effective initial design of the robot, uh, as well as an initial design of the trajectory or the policy. I'm going to use those two terms interchangeably. Um, that, again, is, is a reasonably capable trajectory. So maybe not something that's accessible to someone without extensive experience with bipedal or uh, legged locomotion more generally. Um, and there's also been a lot of work, again, dating really back to classic work of Sims and others on evolutionary methods for doing joint design of agents and their motion. So say, for example, in the context of animation. Um, so what we propose is a method that does this in a model-free. So again, just like the beacon localization work, it's a data-driven approach to doing joint optimization of physical design and the, the policy or the trajectory, the, mo the locomotion trajectory. Um, where we require only that we were that the high level structure, the morphology, how many legs there are, which leg, which link is connected to which, 
that's the that's all we assume. And we can we learn the design and the gate in a data driven fashion. And since we worked on this, a number of other people have done this. So Ha was at, I believe at different Ha, I believe, at DeepMind and some more recent work that's been looking at this again, this coupled design and control from a reinforcement learning approach. And that's what we do. So we formulate this as a reinforcement learning problem. So just very quickly for those not familiar with RL, we're gonna assume we have some agent that interacts with its environment. So it takes some action A, this, this black box environment returns to the agent its next state, ST plus one, and some reward. That's the only feedback that we get is again, this, this reward that, we, that the agent gets from the environment. It doesn't know its dynamics. It just knows that it, it just takes an action and the environment says, well, here's your next state and here's the reward that you get. And so that's what we want to be able to do is train a policy and design in the context of this, this sparse, well, not sparse reward, but this uh, limited form of supervision. So again, I'll just go through this very quickly. But so we have these unknown transition dynamics. And we, what we want to do is we want to find the policy, or the parameters of the policy, theta, star, and the robot design R that maximize the expected discounted long-term reward. Again, in expectation, because we're assuming that the environment, the transition and the, the, the transition dynamics are stochastic. So um, that's what, hence why we have this expectation. So we want to learn, again, the policy and the physical design such that it maximizes some long-term discounted reward. And so we want to do this, as I said, in a model-free manner, meaning we want we don't want to assume we have a we have knowledge of the dynamics. We want it only to be driven by in a task. We want it to be driven based upon the task. So really, what I mean here is the reward. Um, how, however, you can imagine, you know, how, how do we do this? So this is a pretty large space to optimize over. So one thing that we could imagine doing is we could discretize or sample the design space. So let's say we have a two-dimensional design space like this. It's, you know, there are two legs and I'm choosing, you know, each one is the, you know, the x-axis is the length of leg one and the y-axis is the length of L2. And I could sample each location, you know, I could sample from this space, you know, let's say uniformly sample. So each one of these dots now is a particular robot design. And for each robot, I could train a policy that allows it to locomote, that allows it to walk, whether it's over rough terrain, incline, whatever the task is. Uh, in this case, it's going to make as much forward progress uh, as possible, but with some penalties on using, on, on the amount of energy use. And so what I'm showing here is for each dot, again, that's each robot, I have a network that takes as input some history of states or history of images, let's say, for example, that gets fed to the policy and the policy outputs an action, um, you know, joint torque, for example. And so what I could imagine doing is, you know, again, training these separate policies for each one of these robots looking at and then looking at their overall their performance and choosing the one that is that works the best right so i'm going to get this one this the star um that's not really tractable again in, in actuality the space is not two-dimensional it's much it's much higher dimensional we would want to be intelligent about how we do the sampling because in, in what would end up being we'd, we'd end up wasting a lot of samples on designs that really are not controllable based upon uh actuation limits for example um, so again, or designs that might not be physically realizable, something we cannot manufacture. And so the way that we formulate this is, 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 is different. So what we look at is we want to be able to, rather than sample designs, we want to, in, in, in similar spirit to what we were doing before for the beacon allocation, we want to perform gradient-based optimization of the expected reward over the design distribution. So rather than sample, we're going to use gradient-based methods to, max, to, to choose the design that maximizes the expected reward over a distribution of designs, and particularly a multimodal, multimodal distribution over designs. And then rather than training separate controllers for each design or for samples from this distribution, we're gonna train a single control. So uh, it's a controller, that's what I'm visualizing in the bottom, this, this policy, or again, I'll use those terms interchangeably, policy or controller, controller pi, that not only takes as input this history of states or history of images, but also takes as input some representation of the design. So we have a single controller now that's learning to adapt to different designs. 
and we'll see that actually that improves the perform uh, that Im improves performance over one over separate des uh, separate policies per designs. Again, this is more generally an instance of you know a broader class of problems that are looking at again, as I argued before, computational methods for in-person control, but you know also multitask learning. You can think of these different robots as different tasks. And we want a single policy that's able to perform these different tasks, just you know, hand waving. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna formulate this as an RL problem. So we have on the right again is our environment. That environment is taking as input actions. These are joint torques, for example. It's returning observations or the next state, as well as rewards along the top. Those rewards get fed to a you know a, 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 they are used to, per, to perform. A, policy gradients to one, compute, uh, compute two gradients. So we're computing gradients of the reward that allow us to update the control policy, this robot uh, condition or design condition policy, pi, as well as to update the robot distribution. And again, what we're, what we're arguing now is that we're gonna start off with some distribution over designs. It might initially be uniform, but we would like to be able to do is update that distribution such that it devotes more higher density to designs that are better for better at control or more amenable to the task, and lower density to designs that are are you know maybe not physically realizable or result in poor performance or just difficult to control. And so we want to adapt these two jointly. Okay. So um, again, please, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to to jump in. Okay. Um, so again, for the sake of time, I'll just go through this. But again, this is analogous to what, you know, this is essentially what I meant, mentioned before in terms of this, this design condition policy. So now we have these two optimization problems. We want to update, and it's not trivial, right? So we're we're updating this design distribution, or we're also updating the control policy. You can imagine we want to be a little bit careful about how we do these updates. You know, in the beginning, our design distribution is going to be uniform, and our control policy is randomly initialized. So it's not gonna do well in the beginning. So what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna take our design distribution, let's say sample designs from this distribution, give it to our policy, see how they perform and, and right away start updating this distribution because the policy in the beginning is not gonna be very informative. Um, similarly, you know, we don't wanna trust too much from this design, we don't wanna to rely too much on this design distribution initially to update our policy, our policy because again, the design distribution initially is arbitrary. So we have this alternating process, this process rather where, whereby we alternate between updating the robot distribution based upon our current policy and then updating our current policy based upon the, the robot distribution. So this, this chicken and egg-like uh, behavior, okay. And so let's let's look at let's see what this might look like. And so what I'm visualizing here is a uh, again we have some one in the cartoon example we have one di one dimensional uh, design space, um, which is again the length of a of a leg, and we have a, a Gaussian. In practice, we're using a mixture of Gaussians, and where we're showing here is different samples of the design space. Again, what I want to do is I want to argmax over the parameters of the policy and the design distribution. Argmax the expected discounted reward. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take our current distribution, we're going to sample a set of robots and robots from this distribution. Maybe it's uniform. For each one, we're going to take our design condition policy and run it in the environment for some fixed horizon, let's say, for example. And so we get this trajectory of this state action reward tuple, right? Um, for each for each robot, for R1, R2, up through Rn. We're going to collect these trajectories, and these are trajectories under our current policy. We're going to use these trajectories to compute using a, a policy gradient methods to compute the gradient and update our policy pi. So update the parameters of our policy. That's what I'm showing in the red block there. We use PPL for this purpose. And then we're going to sample a set of robots. Again, M robots. We're going to compute the total reward under this updated policy for each one of these robots. <coughs> then we're going to take gradients. Uh, and it, gradients over the parameters of this distribution, phi, and we're going to use that to update this distribution. Again, fairly, again, straightforward. Again, they, they, we have a paper that was at ICRA a couple of years back that has all the, the details. And again, our code is all available at SHIP's website. Um, okay, so just quickly, what we, we evaluate this on OpenAI's gym environment. So you may, you may have seen videos of these robots here, Hopper, Walker, and Ant. 
where you know there was a period where a lot of people were using these as test beds for using learned neural control policies for these robots. Okay, and so just more specifics, what we look at is a design distribution. Or what we do is we parameterize again. We assume we know the morphology, so we know which link is connected to which link. We're not adding legs. We're not subtracting legs. What we are optimizing over is the length of each link and its diameter. And we're going to parameterize this distribution as a, a model that is a Gaussian mixture model with eight randomly initialized components. And we're going to look at different tasks, navigating over level terrain, incline terrain. We've also done some work on an erupt terrain. We use a standard reward for RoboSchool, which encourages forward progress, but discourages, um, you know, but penalizes energy use. And we're going to look at a couple of baselines. So one is just training a controller for the default handcrafted design. We'll do another one that's, again, Bayesian optimization based method. Um, another where we actually do what I was analogous to what I was describing earlier, where we sample a set of designs. For each design, we train a controller for it, and then we see how well we can perform. Pick the one that the design control pair that yields the best performance. Okay. So what I'm visualizing here on the top, so each row here is a is a um, particular point in training. Each column is a is a different robot. So we're seeing top to bottom is, you know, top is beginning of training, and then the bottom is later in training. And what I'm visualizing, this is the same period of time. So we're showing this the evolution um, of the of the design as well as the gait. So we can see throughout training for each one of these robots, it quickly learns to make the upper body long and slender, um, the feet in some cases longer, and it learns this bounding gait. So it's learning, you can see how it's updating the trajectory or really the policy, as well as updating the design. And that's true of the walker as well as the ant. It learns for the ant to make the center body very small, the legs long and lanky, makes you know, it easy to make forward progress with also minimizing energy usage. Um, and again, we do this using uh, the default design. So we're showing at the bottom is the optimal policy for the default design for the same period. I don't know, let's say it's 20 seconds. I don't remember what it was. Bayesian optimization. So again, if you're not familiar with Bayesian optimization, you can, where essentially what we're doing, you can think of the design as a hyperparameter, and we're using Bayesian optimization to optimize these hyperparameters, the design as well as the uh, control policy. And you can see again, the design in gates learned by those methods. Again, we use this level, in, level terrain. I think this is actually inclined terrain, despite what it says. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'm going to, I'll, I'll just, I'll, go through, I'll, I'll skip over this. But again, this is just comparing the, the performance of higher on the, farther on the right is better of our method, blue dots, versus Bayesian optimization or this random sampling based methods. And we can see in most cases, ours is outperforming both baselines. <clears throat> there are some exceptions where the random sampling in the bottom, say on inclined terrain for the ant actually does pretty well, but does, still does not outperform our method. Um, an interesting thing to look at with this work is because we're, we have a distribution over designs, we can imagine, we can look at how this design evolves. So on the top here, again, each column here is a different robot. So let's just look at the, the hopper here. So on the top here, you have this, this, this false colored uh, uh, visualization here, where each column here, each sli vertical slice is an instance of training. And so what we do at each slice is we sample from our design space. And then for each one of those designs, so each one of those is different robots, we're going to sample them. We're going to apply the current controller at that point in time and record the reward. And what we're visualizing here is this, this at each slice basically is a histogram over rewards for different samples. So you can see in the beginning, lower left, it's you know the design space is, a, is effectively and they're not quite uniform, but it, you know it's it's randomly sampled. Or sorry, it's a, a random combination of these eight mixture component Gaussian mixture components, and so there's really nothing informative here. You see some designs that are doing reasonably well just by chance, but most designs are doing poor. Um, we can see that underneath now what we're showing is each of the parameters of of our design associated with their with, with their variance. We could see that you know roughly you know was it point one when we allow ourselves to update the design distribution. So there's this burn-in phase where we just try to, up, we just update the controller. At point one, we, I think it's around point one, we allow ourselves to update the design distribution. You can see it very quickly converges to the, the final uh, optimal parameters. And we see that also in the, in the reward plot, where again, most of the density now is around 
these, these higher performing rewards. Again, there are still some outliers. You can see these little specks in the visualization. Uh, okay, and so one thing we do is we, we visualize this, right? So we can plot this. So this is showing our hopper early on in training. Again, the beginning of training, it doesn't do anything. It just falls over, maybe just stands there. This is showing the evolution of the design. Um, and again, it learns this you know, bounding uh, gait. Um, again, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over. But again, I have the videos are all on the website. So we compare it to the baseline and we have them race all this you know, fun stuff. Uh, okay, so one thing we found with that is that, and, and if you played with this, you may have seen that, is that our method would exploit designs that were actually not physically realizable initially. So we found it learning to make the feet very, very small because that exploited some error in the physics engine that would cause the robot to fly. We were wondering why we're getting this really high reward. And we look at a video and the robot's flying and it's not exerting any energy and it's making a lot of forward progress. So it's getting a lot of reward. And it learned to do that by essentially gaming the reward. It learned that if it made the feet really small, again, there's this instantaneous impulse force that allows it to fly. And so we were looking at, well, you know, what can we do to ensure that the resulting design control pairs are, you know, physically realizable? And so we're looking at this in a different domain. This is with a, a colleague of mine that she was a research faculty at TTIC, Audrey Siddall, she's now at, at, at McGill, uh, soft robotics. So looking at, can we come up with the design of a soft robot for manipulation task or a locomotion task together with the control policy uh, that are together jointly optimized. And so we do this for locomotion. So there's this, these pneumatic actuators called new nets. So we're looking at the top, it's a top-down view of a robot. And on the bottom, we have a slice through these new nets. So these new nets have a hose coming out of them. You, by controlling the pressure, you can inflate these new nets. You can control, you basically control their shape. And if you, if you control their shape in the right way and place them in the right location on the disc, you can allow these, this robot to locomote. And I'll show a video of that. And so again, this is just our setup in the lab. We have three regulator, pressure regulators, and each regulator, each leg is, con is connected to one of these regulators. So some legs may share a regulator and we're controlling their pressure with the goal of making this robot, you can sort of see it in the, in the background there in the top plot, making it locomote. Again, I, I have some videos. Okay, so what we do is we, in this case, we're, we're reasoning over the morphology. So again, we have this design space. So we have this center disc, you may have seen this, this rigid disc. And we have locations on that disc where we can choose to place one of these new nets. And so it might be difficult to tell from the visualization. So gray here, actually, so the two in the top, two in the bottom, indicate there's no leg there. So we're choosing not to place a leg there. The other legs, which we're, we're placing there, and the color indicates which regulator they're connected to. So again, it's analogous to this for the beacon allocation, which channel they're broadcasting on. So C, in this case, C is three. And so we have, we have four choices. No beacon, or sorry, no actuator, or no leg there, or leg attached to regulator one, leg attached to regulator two. And so we're visualizing for that same design, the colors are a little bit off. On the right here, I'm pointing, you can't see where I'm pointing, but on the right, you can see a, a, a rendering of that design actually in, in simulation. Okay, so we train this in a similar way to what we trained before. So again, what we want to learn is we want to learn where to place legs on this disc. And for the legs that are there, which of the three regulators that are controlling their pressure. So that's the design. And we're going to maintain a distribution over this design space. And then we have a control policy that takes as input the particular design, as well as oh, really takes as input the particular design and some observation. And in our case, we're actually doing this in, a, in an open loop fashion and outputs the pressure for the N regulators, let's say three regulators with the goal of making this robot locomote. And again, I, for the sake of time, I'll go through this. I think I'm a little bit running out, running a bit low. Again, just the visualization of doing this. Whereas the legged robot domain, the, the simulation that we were using, which was Pi Bullet or based on Bullet was very fast. Soft body simulators are terribly slow. Um, so we looked at SOFA, it's about a hundred times slower than real time. So far too slow for RL, particularly when we're also reasoning over different designs. So we spent a lot of time, and again, um, there's been, I should say, there's been a lot of work in the last couple of years developing uh, uh, simulators that allow for faster simulation as well as differential, differential simulators. But however, with some trade-off in terms of realism, um, you know, some, some work actually out of, out of ETH on using this to design soft body robots. And so that's what other people have done 
as well. Um, so again, I'll just go through this for the sake of it. So we put a lot of effort in trying to improve the computational. So we, we want to improve the efficiency of the simulator. So again, our goal is to learn a design and control pair that is physically realizable, where you actually want to go manufacture that robot and have it locomotive. So we want to minimize the sim to real gap. And in fact, what I'll show in a bit is how we did this without any sim to, with any fine tuning on the real robot. We trained our design and learned our design and controller and simulation and then manufactured it and then ran our policy on it. Um, and so we spent a lot of time on, again, and the details are in a, in a paper that's on our lab's webpage, but on doing model order reduction in a way that's consistent with co-optimization that allows us to efficiently mod change the design without having to redo model order reduction for each design. And again, for the sake of time, I'll skip through that. But okay, so let's look at, again, similar to the legged locomotion, we can look at a histogram of designs. So again, what the x-axis is, is different points during training. Each vertical slice is showing a samples from the design distribution where we took those samples, we took our current policy, and again, we have one policy for all the designs. We use that policy to run a bunch of episodes in the environment, look at the reward, and that's what we're visualizing here. So initially our design distribution is uniform, and uh, most of the designs in the bottom there are essentially getting zero reward or some actually getting negative reward. reward. This blue line is, is the, the highest performing reward. So there are some designs that do well. And so we see once around 200,000 iterations where we allow ourselves to update the design distribution, we can see that the density starts shifting up and we end up learning these designs. So that's what the, these, these L1 through L5, these are the top five designs that we learned. L1 is the highest. L5 is, in terms of reward, L5 is the lowest. And that, that's the, those are the ones we learned. So the color, indi again, indicates which uh, pressure regulator that actuator or that leg is connected to. And so the best performing design was this three-legged design. Um, again, we have a baseline controller. It's very similar if, if you're familiar with the Shepard Walker um, out, of, out of Harvard. So it's based upon that. We optimize the gate for this robot in the real world, not in simulation. Again, I, this is how that optimal design locomotive. So this, none, none of these robots are walking terribly fast, but they are making forward progress. So what we're visualizing here is again, this sim to real transfer, no fine tuning in the, in the real world whatsoever. We took the top five designs. This gray bar indicates the reward in simulation. The darker gray, light gray, the darker gray indicates the reward in the real world for, I don't remember how many episodes, it might be five. So that's what these error bars are. And you know, there is certainly some gap um, more prevalent in some of the other designs than the top. The top performing design actually transfers pretty well. The baseline design surprisingly does much better. And we trained it in the real world. It does much better than the real world than it does in simulation. So there are some, um, uh, still some issues to, to address. Um, and again, for the sake of time, I'll skip over this, um, but just play this. So this is our, this is the, again, the, ba the baseline design. So the reward here is, again, I think it's 20 seconds. How many centimeters can it move forward? That's it. There's no penalty on actuation. Um, but there are limits. When we were training it there, we limited the rate at which the pressure regulators could change um, the, the allocation of the, of the legs to facilitate uh, realizability. Um, and so again, this is showing the learned design. So this is the optimal design. It's about, I think, what is it, about twice as fast uh, as the real robot. And we, we saw that, it, you know, we were curious, why does it decide not to have the, to have only one four leg versus two? And we, what we, again, it's, it's, it's all uh, speculation, but what we believe is happening, you could saw it in that video, is that by only having one leg in the front, it, the robot's able to tilt to the right and it reduces friction in the front leg. So when the front leg deflates, it's easier for it to slide forward. And really that's what all these, des these designs are doing is they're, they're exploiting the, the, the contact with the environment to allow sliding when they want and not and slide and, and whereas prevent sliding when they don't want it. Um, and I think I'm, I'm probably, uh, where am I on time? I'm happy to stop here or talk about some of our more recent work on training to test domain shift. Um, sure. So it's virtual. I think uh, it's okay if, if you show some other results. Yeah, I'll just go uh, through this very quickly. Um, so again, we were looking at sim to real transfer for physical designs for the soft body uh, robot. Again, and, and as, as I said before, no, no fine tuning on the real. We took our policy and, and design from simulation, 
we built the robot, which again mounts to making these, uh, the, these new nets, attaching them to the disk, hooking them up to the regulators and running our policy. Um, but what we've also done is, is a fair bit of work with this, my student Takuma on more generally dealing with, and you can see my slides, I hope, training to test domain shift. And so typically, again, this is an issue that you know, we're, we're, we're dealing, a lot of people, researchers are dealing with, is with, with you know, RL by itself is sample efficient. Deep RL is even more sample efficient. And when you couple that with the robots, it really means you have to do much of your training in simulation and then hope that your policy transfers to the real world. <coughs> but typically what you have is you have this distribution shift. So again, imagine some 1D input space, if it's images, say, for example, you're trained in this green distribution. Um, when you go to the real world, the real world does not look like simulation. And so you get this inherent shift. And so there's been a lot of work in, you know, of late trying to mitigate this distribution shift. And so what I'm showing these videos here are different tasks from this distractor control suite from this, this past year. Again, fairly simple control problems, um, you know, cart pull, this locomotion problem. But then you look at a test time. So there's these benchmarks that people look at where they'll change the background or they'll change the camera angle. Um, you can um, change the lighting, say, for example. You, know, you can imagine with the real robot, that's what's going to happen. The lighting is going to be different from, from training. And that's going to result in a, in a shift. And again, I'll go through this by time. If you look at state-of-the-art policies trained in simulation, deployed in this test environment, that shift results in a significant degradation in performance. So this is Dr. QV2, you know, arguably the or one of the state-of-the-art uh, uh, deep RL control pop met methods. And looking at different, what the x-axis is intensity, how much distraction or how much, you can sort of think about is how much distribution shift there is. And, the, and what we're looking at the episode return. So it's very good when, it's, when, they, when, they, when there's little shift, not surprisingly, but it quickly degrades as the, as this, the test and training distribution don't overlap. And so what is a standard approach to dealing with this? It's domain randomization. So effectively, let's imagine we'd have some robot manipulation tasks. We wanna pick up things on a table. Again, we're gonna to have to train in simulation. So we have this simulated environment on the left. A real world environment is gonna look different. No matter how hard we try, the simulator is not gonna be, the fidelity of the simulator is limited. So what we'll do is we'll randomize data during training, essentially trying to spread out this distribution, the training distribution, such that the policy has encountered things that it's gonna see at test time. Again, this assumes that our policy has sufficient capacity. The network is large enough to do this so that we get some overlap. But it also means we're spending a lot of time training a policy on inputs, and then the left here in this case, that the agent, that the, that, that the policy will never see at test time. Okay. And I'll go through this. Um, again, and, and in practice, no matter how hard we try, there are gonna be adversarial examples. Um, so really what we think about this distribution, what, what this line of work argues is that there is some low, it gets, again, this is a toy cartoon, right? Toy, toy example where it's a one dimensional input space, but obviously images are higher dimensional. And our hypothesis is that while nominally there might, while there might be this apparent domain shift, um, there is some lower dimensional embedding in this space for which the distributions are actually very similar. So if you imagine this humanoid on the left, if my input were the pose of a human, not the image, but rather the pose, you can imagine that the distribution shift from training to test is going to be actually very small because the design of the, the robots design in, in, in this in simulation is very similar to or you know, very, very similar to the real robot. So the pose that I suppose that I see during training are going to be very similar to the poses that I see at test time. Of course, we, we, we don't want to assume that we know the pose. We're just given an image. But can we learn that the base of the focus of this work is can we learn some lower dimensional manifold? such that these distributions are actually very similar. And that's what this you know, cartoon is doing. Okay. And just very quickly, that's what we do. And I'll, I'll, um, just, I'll just go through this again very quickly. But what we do is we do this very via an adversarial objective. So we, what we want to learn, we have our policy that's, um, that we've trained. So what we do is we train in our, in our source environment. This could be simulation. In input is an image, output is joint torque. Um, and so our, and when we train in simulation, we take our image, we're going to encode it into some representation Z. So this is some lower dimensional embedding Z uh, via F. So F is our encoder. We learn some embedding. 
that's this lower dimensional representation. We're going to feed that to our policy and we're going to train our policy. So now at, at the end of training, we know that um, given Z's from the, from the train, the, the source or the train distribution, our policy, we can expect our policy to do well. Then we go to the real world and we take that, poly, that, that encoder, give it the image where the images look different. In the beginning, those embeddings are going to look very different. So there's going to be this distribution shift. We can't expect our policy to work well. So what we do is we tr we we do is we have this again fairly standard, you know, a la a GANs, but it's not a GAN, um, but this uh, adversarial objective where we have this discriminator. So what we want to do is we want to train both this discriminator where we're going to randomly give the discriminator an embedding from the source or the simulation domain, or an embedding from the test or the target domain. And its job is to figure out which is which. And we have this encoder F that's trying to learn an embedding that fools this discriminator. Basically, it's what it's essentially hand wave be trying to do is trying to align these distributions so the discriminator cannot tell apart samples from the simulator, it cannot tell apart samples from the simulator from those from the real world. And we have other terms in our objectives, dynamic consistency loss, but that's basically, you know, in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. Um, this, this loss that tries to fool this discriminator in terms of not being able to tell them apart. And when we do this, we find, again, I should say, when we do this, we don't have any access to reward at test time. So we're not doing any fine tuning. All we assume is that in our target or testing environment, we can collect images. We can move the robot around and collect images. I don't need the environment to provide me any reward. I just need to be able to assume that I can move the arm around or have the robot walk. And I'm not gonna touch my policy. So that's how we collect these examples that we're going to give this discriminator. You know, here is an embedding of an image from the real world, or the the or the or simulation. Which is it? Um, and so we look at this again. Here's the same plot that we were looking at before. Before we find that doing this significantly improves performance for a number of different baseline methods without again without any access to reward or any fine tuning at at test time. Just examples of real images, um, and yeah, so just very quickly, we did this for a manipulation domain where we trained a robot in simulation. Its goal is to reach this, reach this red dot. And then we went to the real environment where it looks similar. There's a green background. The robot is actually, it might be difficult to tell, it's actually a different robot. On the left, it's a fetch. On the right, it's UR5. The end effector is different. The most obvious difference is we have a checkerboard on the table. Um, and I'll just show that video now. And then I'll just take questions because I know I'm way over. All right. Let's see. Yes, let me move this. Okay, so this is the video again showing this. Uh, so this is running with our policy. This is Takuma. This is you know late, you know, middle of the night, trying to, you know, running this. You know, it worked again, the policy, no fine-tuning. We're just taking that policy. We're, we're assuming we can we, we can move the arm randomly to collect examples to train our encoder by fooling our discriminator, and then is able to take those embeddings and take the same policy we use during simulation and run it. And I don't know if this video has it, but we run it with ran it with SVA, SVEA, which is a state of the art method for that does is able to do some uh, um, task transfer or sim to real transfer, and it, it fails every time. It just moves the arm to the lower left, no matter where the checker is. Um, um, yeah, so anyway, with that, I know I'm, I'm way over time. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Matthew. Actually, no problem. Uh, very interesting talk, and I guess also very interesting talks, because there were many topics and uh, in very different fields. So let's say, um, Let's see, is there any question from the audience? You can simply unmute yourself and ask. Maybe I, I add one. So you, you were looking at these different design problems. Um, if I'm thinking now about all the applications you saw and, and every time you had uh, something fixed and something that was changing, mm -hmm. uh, are you are you kind of working on a generalization of the techniques you're using 
for each of those applications to be yeah. just an, a particular example of of this general thing. Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, so we're not we're not really wed to these particular domains per se. I mean, I think there were there were there were examples that we we could look at. Uh, there were domains that we were applying this met this method to. But yeah, no, we are interested in in, in doing this more generally. Um, so one distinction that we have, so it, a couple of things that are that are shared between this is again, um, this this idea again because there there is this physical design. So we want an optimization algorithm that's gonna that's able to respect physical constraints. Um, so a standard approach might be to learn, let's say, take a strategy like this, learn a particular design control pair, look at the design, and, and use you know some rule of thumb to say, okay, well that design is not realizable. I can't manufacture it or it's really in practice not possible to control and just throw it out. That's a you know fairly you know a vanilla way of doing and uh, doing this. Um, that's a that's a waste of, of, of resources. Uh, really what we would like to be able to do is we'd like to have those constraints be part of the optimization framework. And that's true in, in the beacon localization that's maybe a little bit easier in some sense. But with the robot design, both the soft robot design, the physical robot design, that becomes a little bit more challenging. And that's why with the, with the robot design work, we, we had to formulate it in, in a different way than we did with the beacon localization. So the beacon localization really, like I said, we were able to formulate it in such a way that we can just optimize it via back propagation. Um, taking the gradient with, of, of, our, of our loss, whatever that is, if it's you know, L2 loss, what have you, with some regularization, and back propagating it through. Um, and that's not specific to beacon localization. That could be used in other ways. So that's also been used in this optimizing a Bayer pattern as well. Um, placing strain, you can imagine doing it for placing strain gauges on a, on, on, a, on a soft robot for estimating its shape or classifying the object it's grasp, grasping. You can imagine back propagating through. So that's a that's an example where that's agnostic to the to the task. Um, for the robot design, we, that basically the, the 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 model itself, we're assuming we don't know the dy dynamics. It's not at least the way that we were looking at it. It was not differentiable. There are differentiable simulators, as I mentioned before. Um, you know, um, you know. Robert at Cashman is, as you, has, has been involved in the development of one, uh, Diff Tai Chi and related to Chain Queen. So those are methods that might allow you to do back propagation all the way through, but it, we, and we played with those. We found that some, there are some issues in terms of physical realism. Um, so that's where we have this, you know, our, really more of an RL-like approach. And again, that's, we've used that for rigid ro robots. We use that for soft robots. That would be useful for, for locomotion. Uh, I think it would just as well apply to manipulation. So it's again more general than these particular domains that we were looking at. These are just you know candidate uh, problems to to look at, really. Um, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, and another thing I should say that one thing we would like to be able to do is is couple really all three. So the first part was sensor design and inference. The second part was physical design and control. But you know, imagine, let's say for the soft robot, soft robot work. Imagine we were to take as input some estimate of the of the shape of of the robot of the of the soft body robot. And okay, so then there's a question: How do we get that estimate? So maybe we play strain gauges. So now we have all three: we have the design of the physical robot, the where to place say, the design of the physical robot, its control policy. So that's one example. It's, so it's physical design, computational reasoning, but we also have the location of the strain gauges and the inference that estimates the shape. So can we, we're interested in optimizing all three or four, depending on how you count, jointly. Yeah, that sounds, so it's interesting. And another question I have regarding this is, how do you cope with uh, choosing a specific cost function that you want to minimize? Because I, I understand that these cost functions in design are usually, if you want to boil it down to a scalar and then you're, you're putting together a lot of different things, right? Yep. And depending on what you put into that, you, you get a, an optimal design. Yep, 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 yeah, exactly. What That's about the, the other side of the philosophy, which is um, to take those cost functions separately and to look at the Pareto optimum of 
optimal robots and, and there is no yeah, that, optimal robot. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, that's not one thing that we did. So with the with the physical with the with the, with the walking design, we just took the whatever the standard uh, reward function that people were using was, um, <clears throat> which again included you know, forward progress and some penalty on um, control effort, but really didn't penalize the design per se. There was no constraint in there saying you know you know make the legs really big. Let's say if that helped, it may have no reason not to do that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. We, we have not looked at that. That's, that's another way that we could look at, again, another example of how we can incorporate some design constraints or at least design priorities into the optimization problem by, let's say, penalizing it for having something that's for which maybe it's physically realizable, but manufacturing it is difficult or costly. Uh, but yeah, no, that, it would be interesting to look at again, considering different objectives. What are the designs that come out? Um, so Chip is a student who's really leading this and he's finishing up soon. And that's one of the things he's looking at is not, I guess, not so much design costs per se, but different, more generally different rewards, I guess, different tasks that if it's, and we looked at a little bit in the context of flat terrain versus incline, but also rough terrain. And how does that, how does, how do, how do those rewards affect the design control pairs that come out? You know, are there qualitative differences and for a robot that's designed to walk over ruts and bumps than there is that's designed to climb uphill. Uh, but you can imagine also incorporating again, design uh, uh, elements to that objective and looking at you know the Pareto curve and seeing how that affects. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Very cool, yeah. Uh, Matt, I have, a, I have a question. I have a yep. question. Yeah. Go on um, So, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, the common wisdom was that, uh, well, if you have a possession problem and just is getting the scent, then that's not a very good way to do it because mm -hmm. there are local minima and things like that. Mm -hmm. And now I see that uh, usually now when you see down the comparison of uh, deep learning methods with the, so the baseline, then I guess the conclusion is obvious that, well, we don't have any guarantee for the deep learning part, yep. but at least it's better than the, than the baseline. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I wanted to ask, you know, your opinion about that. Uh, and also like a more general question, I think, uh, so I think we discovered that there's a lot of problems that uh, can be made differentiable, mm -hmm. um, but you know, what, what's the negative result? Like, uh, you know, uh, what, is it clear what is the class of problems that, uh, you cannot just solve uh, like with stochastic gradient descent. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so again, so we to be clear, you know, we were using the, the for the for the beacon placement. Our assumption was is that both that the, throughout the whole process is differentiable, especially when we, we incorporate the softmax on the beacon allocation. Um, <coughs> for the for the locomotion, it's not. So we're using policy gradient methods. So we couldn't just take standard stochastic gradient descent, but that's still you know that's still a, a good good question is that, of course, this optimization landscape is very complex. There's, there are no guarantees in terms of the optimality of the resulting design and controller. Um, what we did anecdotally, what we found, and let's see if I, um, let me just go back here. One interesting thing that we found, okay, yeah, there's this cartoon, this example that I gave before is, you know, um, where we sample the designs and for each design, we train a control policy. What one thing we, we did is we took the, again, we did this, I think, I don't know for the soft body, but for the rigid robot, we took whatever the, the resulting optimal design was, and we trained a control policy from scratch that only had to control that robot. So again, when we were doing our method, our single mm -hmm. policy had to control all the different samples from our distribution. We said, let's not have it happen. It doesn't have to do that anymore. Let's just let it overfit essentially to this robot. And we trained it, and it turns out the reward of that policy for that design was actually consistently lower than that of the policy that had to be trained to adapt to all the different robots throughout training. Now, mm -hmm. again, it's, it's getting that, that, that controller that's allowed to overfit to that design is getting stuck in some local minima 
Whereas this controller that has to deal with many different designs is sort of is it, it sort of provides some form of you know domain randomization is not the right not the right term, but you know hand wavy helps it to navigate some of these it helps to prevent pre helps prevent it from getting stuck in these local optima. But yeah, no, there's no there are no guarantees, right? So um, yeah, there's no guarantee that by any means that what we're discovering is the optimal design or is the optimal control policy. Um, and so I imagine that there are there are there are certainly problems for which the, the, this optimization landscape is is more is easier to or this landscape is easier to optimize over than others. Uh, I don't have a you know I don't have a you know a concrete sense of of of, of what that is. You know more anecdotal. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question for Matthew? Right, I think you left your contact uh, in the yeah, so, maybe yeah. in the last there slide or so. Yeah, so all the, the papers that I presented, there are three or I guess four of them, they're all on our website, ripple.ttsc.edu. I think for all, most if not, actually no, all of them, I think the code is available. Maybe not yet the invariance through inference, the last piece, um, but every, that, that will be shortly if it's not. Um, great. Thank you very much, Matthew, for the great talk and good luck for the next steps. Thanks. Um, and I will follow up with the video. Sounds uh, good. Thank you all for participating and see you all next week.